Thank you, Eliza, and thank you all for coming. I'm so honored to be here. Is this, is the sound, is that working? Okay, great. Um, well, I realize I'm in a very historic place, um, and to talk about tea here is, um, is, is sort of overwhelming. Um, but it did, thinking about the talk, I, I did begin to think about any possible connection between the Boston Tea Party, the one and only, and um, the tea parties of Rose Nichols. And there is a little connection beyond the being in the same city and um, centered around the same substance. Um, as I thought about it, uh, Rose Nichols tea parties had nothing to do with taxation, um, but they did have something to do with representation, um, and they definitely had something to do with, with free speech, which was uh, of great interest of hers. Um, talk, really, um, between people of, of all kinds um, was something that interested her very much. Um, You'll see what I mean when I uh, get to that. But I um, just wanted to, before uh, reading to you about her, part, her tea parties, I'll just tell you a little bit about how this uh, project began. Um, Elaine Negroponte is really the author of this book. Um, and unfortunately, she couldn't join us. Um, but. Elaine is really responsible for the idea and the, uh, the, the whole execution of it. Um, Elaine was, uh, is a, a resident of Beacon Hill and a uh, close neighbor of the Rose Nichols House Museum at number 55 Mount Vernon Street. You, some of you may know this uh, house museum and you may even know more about Rose Nichols than I do, but um, if, if you don't, it's right at the top of the hill. Um, very special house in that it looks down to the river as opposed to across the street at other houses. Um, and it was allegedly designed by Charles Bullfinch. Um, this may not be true, but it's still very elegant. And um, Rose Nichols wanted to preserve this house when, after, after her death because she wanted to be sure there was at least one house on Beacon Hill that, was, that represented the way these interiors were in the old days, meaning her days. Um, and it, this turned out to be a very good idea because, as you know, since the 1950s, so many houses have been converted, um, divided, and uh, redesigned and redecorated. So at least we have the Nichols house, uh, which we can depend on as a, a place we can walk into the past. So um, Elaine's idea came about when uh, she began to think about how, she, how this house might be even more enlivened um, uh, in a real way. And she was on the board there. and. At a certain point, um, a little collection of recipes came forth, and this was the co this was the collection of Mary King, who was um, Rose Nichols' cook. Um, this uh, Elizabeth Driscoll, who also is a, a co-author, was the one who came up with this uh, group, and. Um, Elaine became very intrigued, being a very, very good cook herself, um, and also uh, a meticulous hostess. And um, she also knew that Rose Nichols was an interesting person. So she ap approached me as a, collaborate on a collaborator on a kind of um, biography slash cookbook um, about Rose Nichols. Um, It was also just in time, as there were uh, people on the Hill who still remembered these parties, and we, we really wanted to capture a, a, a sense of what, what it was like to, to, um, to be there. Um, 
Well, as you may know, that, and when you write a cookbook, you have to uh, test every single recipe several times. Um, and if, you're, if these are old, old recipes that were written some time ago, um, you might have to reinterpret them or, or adjust them, re rewrite them for contemporary cooks. So I also got roped into this um, recipe testing exercise, which was very interesting um, and, and quite fun. Um, and we even staged a kind of reenactment of a Rose Nichols tea party at the house uh, in the midst of our research, which was an amazing, aff amazing affair, really, um, to see it really come alive that way. Um, now, I also learned more about Rose Nichols beyond the, her um, the tea parties. And she, in fact, was a garden designer of, of some renown, uh, a real professional. She traveled all over America uh, designing gardens for people uh, in grand houses. And she also was a historian of garden design. She wrote three books on garden design one on English gardens, which she didn't really approve of. Um, that is, she didn't approve of the landscape style. Uh, she wrote another on um, Portuguese and Spanish gardens, she thought were underappreciated, and another on Italian gardens, which of course are not underappreciated, and she loved them too. Um, so she was a very accomplished person uh, she also spent her summers growing up in Cornish, New Hampshire. So we, we went up there to visit another house museum, which is the Augustus St. Gordon's Monument. You may also know about this amazing place. Um, the sculptor St. Gordon's was her uncle by marriage and also an early mentor of hers. And also in, in Cornish, which was a very lively uh, summer community of creative people meeting a sort of meeting ground between New York and Boston um, was Charles Platt the architect and garden designer he was also an important mentor um, really her her style of garden design can be traced very very uh, clearly to his uh, example um, so we we and we also saw a, a garden, probably the only one of hers that still survives, sort of, uh, in Cornish at their, at her family's summer house in Cornish, which is also still there. The Cornish is definitely worth a visit um, for all these reasons. And it's beautiful countryside too. Um, Rose also spent a lot of time in Europe. Um, to, in order to research her books, and uh, she, this is a great excuse to travel all over the place, meet all kinds of people. She'd learn about a, a garden uh, anywhere, and um, she would simply boldly get in touch with the owner of the of the house. Um, and if she didn't get an, an invitation right away, she would just go there anyway and and ask for the head gardener and dressed very well so that uh, he would be terrified of turning her away. And this is the way she, she got herself around. Um, she also was a friend of Bernard Berenson, who, also from Boston. Um, Berenson introduced her to many interesting people in, in Europe. And uh, in this way, she got around and uh, just met all kinds of people. And I guess this is where I think you would call her a connector, if you, uh, if you know this term that I guess Malcolm Gladwell uh, maybe has coined, um, which means that she was in the, among the 20% of the population that is responsible for introducing the rest of the 80% of the population to each other. Um, she just thrived on um, 
making introductions and uh, crossing all kinds of lines between uh, people's backgrounds and, and her own and, um, and making other people do, do the same. So by the time she got home to Boston, uh, kind of to retire, um, she knew a lot of people and uh, was very worldly, uh, could talk on any subject, um, from politics to art to uh, gardens, um, and was ready to kind of set the stage for a kind of salon, really, um, that was, that sort of took the form of these uh, tea parties every Sunday afternoon. Um, now I'm going to read to you just a, a little passage from the book about, uh, about these tea parties. I hope you get the sense of the atmosphere of them. Um, Tea with Miss Rose Nichols was really a salon. These gatherings had a purpose, and it was not to discuss the weather. Quote, the whole point of these teas was not really tea, but to get people of different beliefs together, recalled her nephew's wife, who was frequently asked to pour. Rose Nichols believed that challenging their beliefs led her guests to find the common ground on which all people stand and make peace with each other. She would invite an arch-conservative like William Loeb, editor of the Manchester Union Leader, with a nice young Harvard student who happened to be a communist and sort of steer them toward each other. Quote, because she thought they ought to argue together, and they did too. One Beacon Hill neighbor and frequent tea guest, the poet Francis Howard, confessed, quote, I was never really sure why she asked me. We disagreed on every conceivable subject. But that was exactly what interested Rose. It was not the combination of ginger with cloves that concerned her. That was the cook, Mary King's department. But rather a dash of liberal and a pinch of conservative that promised a good tea. Controversy was her spice. Should you have been among the carefully chosen 12 or 15 people of divergent views to appear at number 55 Mount Vernon Street on a Sunday afternoon, you would make your way from the front hall up the circular staircase to the dining room with its family portraits set against dark floral wallpaper resembling embossed leather. The large mahogany table was laid with trays and tea sandwiches, cakes and cookies. One of the lady guests would be asked to pour, an honor, though a dubious one, as she would be lucky to get a cup of tea herself before the supply ran completely dry. Meanwhile, the other guests had plenty of time to graze and mingle and gently warm up to the conversational challenges that lay ahead. Presiding over her gatherings, Rose Nichols had a stately presence, the saloniste par excellence. She was tall, lean, and theatrically dressed, favoring dark velvets and embroidered bodices which, like her garden designs, hinted at medieval and Renaissance origins. She always wore a hat, and her hats, quote, were like velvet puddings, as we see one of such velvet pudding on the cover here. As the artist Polly Thayer recalled, anchored firmly in her long, by her long, thin face, sidelong glance, and arched brow. Rose herself was known to have never eaten a thing at her own parties. She declared that she could not talk and eat at the same time. And given the choice, she would always choose to talk. For Rose, quote, nourishment was of the mind, as Mary King, the cook, Riley observed. From the dining room, Rose directed the party across the hall to the drawing room, upon which she had lavished her eclectic taste for a medieval Flemish tapestry, English furniture, Japanese porcelain, and Persian carpets, blended here in an overall color scheme probably best described as old rose, which now the late afternoon sun bathed in a spray of gold. 
Here the guests would seat themselves to form a circle. In her distinctive low voice, which some would describe as lugubrious, Rose would call on someone in the group, Mr. Mitchell, I understand you've just returned from China. Can you tell us about it? She would pick on people who would be loud and interesting, recalled her nephew. Maybe after 20 minutes or so, she would shoot to a new topic. She expressed not the slightest interest in, in jokes or small talk or the weather. Frances Howard, a frequent guest, recalled that if the party was suitably conservative, Rose would throw out some remark like, I feel we've been unreasonably rude to the poor dear Russians. She would then sit back and bask in the fireworks. In the absence of a hot political issue, she would throw out some sprawling topic like, what is your idea of heaven? Emerging somewhat later on a particularly lively evening, as late as eight o'clock, with increasing gratitude for Mary King's cakes and tea sandwiches and your mental faculties quite exhausted, you would have to admit that something had happened. You had met someone you might otherwise have assiduously avoided. A stranger had become a friend. You had mixed with the younger or the older generation. You had warmed to a foreigner, a commoner or a nobleman and forgotten the difference. Your fondly held opinions had been tickled or teased or simply trashed. You had participated in what Rose Nichols considered to be that great Puritan tradition, the broadening of the mind. And, well, that's, that should give you a little idea um, of what I could um, try to put together um, from various uh, um, witnesses. And now I just want to tell you a little bit about the recipes in this book, which are, which are quite uh, unusual. Um, some, some are unusual because they're very old-fashioned. Um, things like uh, boiled raisin cake and, um, and uh, Aunt Alice Cole's almond cake. Uh, then there are such uh, sort of wonders as the candied mint leaves, which um, I tried, and it, it's not that hard, actually. <laughs> um, and then the souffléed crackers, which really, uh, the only ingredients here are crackers, saltines, um, and I think that's it. It's extremely hard. In fact, it's almost impossible, but um, there's a challenge. Um, there are also several recipes that involve tea, um, but aren't just tea such as Pilgrim's Punch, Emerald Ice, and Ginger Frappe. And um, Elaine also uh, includes instructions on how to make a, a decorative ice block for the punch bowl, that is with flowers or whatever you want in it. Um, Elaine also became kind of obsessed with the um, idea of Boston frugality. She mentions this in a lot of kind of sidebars through the book. There are wonderful anecdotes about uh, and quotes about Boston hats and, um, and uh, ways of reusing things and um, things that charmed her a, a great deal. Um, and then there are little snippets of history, little bite size, um, shall we say, um, stories like the one about Hukwa, the tea. Um, you may all know this, but let's see. I'll just read to you about, about Hukwa. Many people wonder about the difference between China's Hukwa and Lapsang Souchong teas. Hukwa the milder of the two, is smoked over pine needles. Lapsang Souchong is smoked over the more pungent wood of the camphor tree. 
The name Hukwa was used by Mr. Wendell in honor of Hukwa, the famous Chinese tea merchant with whom Wendell's uncle, the original owner and importer, had traded in the early 19th century. So you'll learn all kinds of things like that. Um, and um, as well as, I, I must also say that Elaine is a, a real perfectionist when it comes to um, how to do things. And um, it has great taste as well. And so everything that's, that's really, every, everything she describes here is, uh, is, is kind of invaluable information if, you're, if you really want to do a proper tea. Um, I, I can promise you that. Um, but um, what really matters, of course, in the end is the company. And that was really the essence of, of, of Rose Nichols Tea Parties. I'm just going to read you one last paragraph, and then I'll, I'll be happy to take questions about Rose or uh, garden design or um, souffle crackers or anything. Um, Let's see. Right. Um, so there's one last word of advice on tea parties. There is no precise recipe for Rose Nichols gatherings, Rose Nichols gathering of minds. For every tea party contain different ingredients and unpredictable combinations. Add a dash of the sweet to the savory. Mix the frivolous with the frugal, the glamorous with the plain, the old with the young, and something interesting in the best Boston tradition is bound to happen. Thank you. She, um, okay, now, now you're, um, I'm going to find that I'm a little rusty on <laughs> my Rose Nichols history. Um, I can't remember how old she was exactly, but she was old. Um, and she was active, though less active. Um, I mean, the whole point of the tea parties was that this was her, her way of being active without really leaving home and with having the support around her. And it, it was a kind of extension of her, um, of her earlier activities, which began with her mother, uh, trying to get her mother involved in, in reading groups on the hill and um, the suffragist movement in Cornish and, and, and she was always part of um, these kinds of group activities, these um, groups of people getting together to talk and exchange ideas. You mean was she, was she very glamorous or um, I don't Hostess par excellence, exactly. Um, she was in a. I, I think she was in in, in Boston anyway. Um, but she was uh, definitely. This is this was more of a of a uh, intellectual kind of gathering than a glamorous one. Shall I read you the recipe? Yeah, okay. Because I don't know how to souffle crackers. I think I tried this. It was really hard. I'm not sure it's worth it either, but anyway. Um, it's, it comes under, this is, the book is divided into these uh, recipe, uh, menus. Um, and uh, everything from the Cornish tea to the Beacon Hill tea, European tea, tea in bed which is a great idea. Um, this one, I think, is in the kitchen tea. Um, there's no index, but, okay, a kitchen tea. Were you there for the reenactment? The, the, I, yeah, I, I don't think we had the souffle crackers there anyway, but, um, Let's see, okay, so. Let's see.
it does say, try a few ahead of time so you know what to expect. Um, one package of Vermont common crackers, but that would be saltines. One stick unsalted butter, parchment paper, well greased, ice water, ice tray container of ice. Preheat oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Cut parchment paper to fit into a large shallow sided baking pan and grease well. Split crackers in half and to place on a parchment paper in pan. Cover the crackers completely with cold water and ice cubes, using the ice to weigh down any of the crackers that float. Soak the crackers until they have softened up to four minutes for the harder Vermont crackers, approximately two minutes for the more fragile saltine type cracker. They must not be falling apart in italics. Drain water. If necessary, rearrange crackers in the pan. Dot each cracker with a quarter teaspoon of butter and bake for 10 to 15 minutes at 500 degrees until dry and puffed. Do not open the oven door during this time. Reduce oven temperature to 375. Continue to bake for approximately 30 minutes or until thoroughly dry and lightly browned. The crackers can be made several hours in advance and then loosely covered with foil. Reheated in a 375 degree oven for three to five minutes. Serve with sweet butter and good homemade preserves. Yield approximately 50. As I say, I'm not sure it's worth it, but um, that is one of the, that's the extreme end of this cookbook. There are also some dead simple, amazing recipes. One of my favorites is um, for uh, broccoli tea sandwiches, where it's, it's just the flowers of the broccoli sort of shaved off with a very sharp knife, mixed with mayonnaise, white bread, delicious. <laughs>